it gives me great pleasure to introduce my long-standing friend and very long-standing Shintaido practitioner, Peter Furtado. This is about Shintaido history, but also Shintaido present and Shintaido future, hopefully. You're probably familiar with the story of how Shintaido began, how in the 1960s, Aoki-sensei, the leading student of karate master Shikuru Igami, sought to adapt and extend the martial art traditions that he'd learned for the modern age, how he developed Tenshin Goso as a simple, accessible form that embodied his vision, then discovered Eiko and built the entire curriculum based on these two things, plus meso or meditation. Uh, by the way, I want to say I'm aware that some people here may be fairly new to Shintaido. I'd like to apologize in advance to you as some of what I must say may be hard to follow, but I hope you can get the gist at least and that the images and videos I will show are helpful. I'm a historian. That means I want to find out about the past and relate it to other things I know and am interested in. I care about what people did, thought and felt and how this changed over time. But I also care about what significance these things hold for us today. I also want to understand the context of what people did, because that context is what gave their actions so much of their meaning and power. So when it comes to Shintaido, I don't just want to learn about the men and women who created it. I want to study all the things that influenced them and explore the context in which they were practicing. If you specifically want to learn about the martial arts lineage of Shintaido, then I refer you to the excellent talk called Shintaido Prehistory that Andrew Stones gave in 2015, which you can find on YouTube. Today, I want to complement his talk by taking a more contextual approach. Haki-sensei may have created Shintaido, but he did not do it alone. He brought together some committed students, Ito-sensei and Masashi among them, to collaborate in exploring the boundaries of what was possible. He's written movingly about how these students, late at night on December the 1st, 1966, spontaneously found Eiko, though of course Aokusensei himself had created the conditions for them to do so, instantly saw what they'd found, felt its majesty and power to transform both the martial arts and the human soul itself, and placed it at the heart of his new body way. In fact, the collaboration went even further. <clears throat> Other fundamental Shintaido techniques, like Hikari, playing with light or wakame siwi practice, were also first discovered by the students and later developed into key parts of the Shintaido curriculum. Fifteen months before Eiko Night, in September 1965, Aoki-sensei and 12 young collaborators, seven men, five women in their early 20s, had formed a group known as Rakutenkai, in which they committed to explore together how to extend the possibilities of what it means to be alive. I've always been told that Rakutenkai means band of optimists, but this being the Japanese language, the word has other resonances, including purity, progress, and perfect liberty. Optimism, purity, progress, perfect liberty, these are just the kind of big words that attract idealistic young people. The group lived communally. People practiced all night and worked all day. One member drove a taxi to a sense they worked in a restaurant. They didn't sleep much. Over the next five years or so, there were 50 or 60 members with two main generations of a dozen core members each. Ito was in the first, Masashi in the second. And other people were more loosely associated. Some were high level martial artists. Others focused on meditation or Christianity and others on the arts, painting or tea ceremony. But they were all attracted by Aoki-sensei's martial arts knowledge, his spiritual depth and intuition, his cultural breadth, and above all, his personality, specifically his openness, which was so different to the strict hierarchical approach of other martial arts teachers. Ito-sensei, who trained with Aoki-sensei under their joint master, Egami-sensei, before becoming a founder member of Rakutenkai, found Aoki-sensei very special, not least, because he was prepared to talk to anyone about anything, world literature, classical music, art. 
The aims of the Rakutenkai were clearly presented in what today we would call a mission statement, to pursue truth through daily life, to acquire perfect liberty, to live with the light of liberty and become the light of the world. In this talk, I want to focus on these words and to try to understand what they meant at the time in the context of 1960s Japan then to ask how that mission has matured and changed over the years, and finally, what it might mean today in our very different world of the 2020s. Let's begin with post-war Japan. Westerners often think of Japan's traditional culture and arts as pure and unsullied by external influence, the product of the two, two centuries from 1635 to the 1850s, when Japan was almost entirely cut off from the outside world. To understand Japan, they believe, we have to enter the mindset of that closed world. This is surely true. Nevertheless, this isolation is by no means the whole story. By 1965, Japan had been neither isolated nor closed for more than a century. Cultural and political interactions had been growing for decades, and Aokisensei's richly diverse interests in many ways embodied them. A hundred years earlier, the ruling conservative shogunate had been overthrown and Japan had opened itself to the West politically, economically and culturally. This was a two-way process. Western traders, soldiers and scholars arrived to take whatever they could from the island empire, while Japan sent some of its cleverest people to the West to learn, absorb Western ways and bring back whatever might be useful in order to make Japan a powerful member of the world community. They were so successful that by the first decade of the 20th century, Japan had built a modern army and navy, conquered Korea, defeated Russia, extended its sway even further in the East Asia during the First World War. I don't need to tell you how this developed a few decades later in the 1940s. Historians sometimes suggest that technical imports were central to this expansion while Japan's society and values were touched less deeply. This too is not quite right. In politics, in 1890, a new Western-influenced constitution brought uh, Asia's first democratically elected parliament to Japan. And assimilation was important in culture as well. You may remember that at a Kangeko five or six years ago, Masashi introduced us to the tea ceremony, a tradition unique to Japan and expressive of so much that is distinctive about its sensibilities. He asked us to read a book entitled The Book of Tea by Kakuzo Okokura. Okokura wrote it in English in 1904. To me, this book was a revelation. The author, who was born and educated in Japan, was writing on a quintessentially Japanese topic. Yet, to me, it seemed as if he had written with such a sophisticated Western aesthetic that if I hadn't known better, I might have guessed that he was brought up in Paris, Vienna or Boston. He believed traditional Japanese culture could be encouraged not by retreating into conservatism, but by openly embracing whatever a Western viewpoint could bring. He was not alone, as we'll see later. Through the early 20th century, Japan soaked up Western lifestyle, ideas, art and industry like a sponge. Here's another Japanese crossover cultural icon, this time from the 1920s, an artist who became a celebrity in both Paris and Tokyo, particularly for his paintings of cats using Japanese techniques and materials. In fact, ever since 1867, Japan had existed in a kind of tension between on the one hand, the desire to celebrate and build up exclusively Japanese qualities what's sometimes called Japanese exceptionalism, and on the other hand, the desire to take part fully in the world community on an equal footing, what's called universalism. The two things sometimes combined in the desire to take on the rest of the world on its own terms, but show that the Japanese way was intrinsically superior to others. The mindset of the Imperial Japanese army was exceptionally Japanese, but the technology it used to attack Pearl Harbor was universal. 
After 1945, reeling from devastating bombing and defeat, and now under American occupation, Japan aimed to rebuild its place in the world by creating a distinctive business culture that would allow it to outdo the West on its own terms through the great corporations like Honda and Mitsubishi and the armies of salarymen who worked for them day and night. In this, it proved remarkably successful. The reason for this digression on Japanese history is that the tension between Japan's belief in its unique self-contained traditional culture and its acceptance of Western modernity can be seen in Shintaido. As you know, Aoki-sensei was strongly influenced amongst other things by Western theater, by European and American painting, especially the abstract expressionism and pop art that were at their peak in the early 1960s and he brought all these things to his deep study of the traditional Japanese martial arts. Um, here are two 1960s artists whose work feels very Shintaido to me, though I don't know what Aoki Sensei thought about them specifically. Eve Klein studied Judo in Japan. His art involved laying the canvas on the floor and covering his models who were young, female and naked with blue paint then inviting them to move freely across the canvas. Lucio Fontana was very different. He was an Argentinian who created a field of rich, solid color, and then used a knife to cut through to the infinity beyond. This particular painting, Venice was all in gold, has been in my heart for almost 40 years as the image of Kiri Oroshi cutting. In the 1950s and 60s, some people in Japan tried to encourage Budo or traditional martial arts specifically for nationalistic purposes. Before the war, martial arts had been compulsory in Japanese schools as they were thought to teach the essential military spirit and devotion to the emperor. However, in 1945, the Americans banned organizations that promoted martial arts in the old spirit of militarism and emperor worship. Instead, they required the Japanese education system to, quote, respect individual dignity, to aim at raising people who will aspire for truth and peace and seek universal and characteristic culture. So the drive to revive traditional martial arts in the post-war period sometimes carried heavy political overtones. Aoki Sensei, himself had no time for this conservative approach, setting himself much more idealistic goals. Then there was his commitment to Christianity. He did not belong to any Christian denomination, but he followed what was called the non-church movement or Mu Kyokai. This had been set up in the early 20th century by Kanzo Uchimura, Uchimura was a contemporary of Okukura who wrote the Book of Tea. In his twenties, he, like Okukura, went to the United States to study, where he was very influenced by Quakerism. Like them, he rejected theology, creeds, ritual and formal church structures in favor of small independent groups of the faithful, studying the Bible and following the teachings of Jesus in their everyday lives. Back in Japan, his pacifist views and his refusal to bow to the image of the emperor brought a swift end to his attempts to forge a career as a high school teacher and as a journalist. Uchimura once wrote, the universe is created by God. Nature itself is our earthly church. Its ceiling is the blue sky. To me at least, this language is reminiscent of Psalm 19, which Aoki Sensei quoted, in order to put echo into words, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. This brings us all back to the young men and women who joined Aoki Sensei in the Rakutenkai. What about those key words in the mission statement, truth, liberty, light of the world? What meanings did they carry for them? I suspect they were an amalgam of East and West, of Christianity and Buddhism, and they also had particular political meanings in the context of 1960s Japan. In English, we have two terms, liberty and freedom. Liberty tends to be political, 
It carries various resonances, including echoes of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, and fraternity, of the American Revolution. We have certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And also of the British belief in liberty as being something protected by the rule of law. Freedom, on the other hand, is a more personal or internal state than liberty. We want to be free from constraints or free to think, say, or do as we want, free to make choices. Freedom is also a spiritual concept. As the Church of England says uh, in its prayer book of Christ, his service is perfect freedom. The Japanese language has the same distinction. Kaiho means liberty or liberation in the sense of release from oppression or from being tied or restricted. Its kanji includes the same root as kaisho, open hand in Shintaido. The other word jiyu means freedom, particularly in the sense of escaping from internal psychological or moral constraints or letting go negative mental habits that cause stress and sickness or limit our potential to be fully free. In fact, the original Rakutenkai mission statement, obviously written in Japanese, used the word jiyu, freedom, but when it was translated into English, it became liberty. That's the form I learned it. So perhaps it would be more accurate if it read, to pursue truth through daily life, to acquire perfect freedom, to live with the light of freedom and become the light of the world. Or perhaps this confusion is significant. They were seeking both internal freedom and external liberty. They were also combining Eastern and Western spirituality. Aksensei described acquiring perfect freedom in these essentially Japanese terms, relaxing, releasing our ki, harmonizing with nature, lib fully liberating ourselves and becoming as free as possible. But he also added, in Christianity, freedom means accepting God 100%. In Zen, it means to get rid of all attachments. The more we release, the more we become full. And in another Christian dimension to the Rakutenkai mission, the last line to become the light of the world is not just an expression of shosei, of 10 point meditation, but echoes Jesus's famous phrase from St. John's gospel. I am the light of the world. In reality, Rakutenkai members were searching both for internal freedom and for political liberty. Of course, they were seeking spiritual depths, but they were also looking for liberation from the constraints of Japanese society and post-war politics. While in theory, the class system in Japan had been abolished, in practice, equality was an illusion. There were many taboos and prejudices that limited social change. Radical young people like the Rakutenkai members sought far more genuine equality and freedom from social norms than was possible in hidebound Japan. Aoki-sensei indeed has said, one explicit purpose in cre creating Tenshin Gozo and developing Eiko was to liberate the Japanese and to change their national character. There's a similar story with the word truth. In the West, the term has a long and complex history. Many have sought an objective truth that corresponds to reality. Though some people have found this revealed in religion and others quite differently in logic, maths or science. Romantics, however, denied that objective truth is ever possible and they believed instead in aesthetic truth. As John Keats said, truth is beauty, beauty truth, is all you know on earth and all you need to know. And an internal moral truth in the sense of being true to yourself. In Japanese culture, on the other hand, truth is found by stripping away superficial elements and discovering true essence. All these types of truth come together in Shintaido. In Ita Sensei's recent time year workshop, for example, he talked about shin or truth, meaning everlasting truth, reality, justice, righteousness, and purity. 
In the 60s, Japan saw thousands of new religions, cults, and experimental arts groups set up in a frenzied search for a new source of truth and meaning. Most of them quickly collapsed. A few have survived. Shintaido is one. Another is Buto, a dramatic dance form founded by Hichikata Tatsumi and Kazuo Ono around 1959. There was some crossover of personnel between Shintaido and Buto, and one Rakutenkai member, Aki-sensei's wife Etsuko, also studied Buto with Ono-sensei. The two movements have much in common, though whereas Shintaido focuses on the world of the light, Buto mainly draws its energies from the underworld. Altogether, I believe Aki-sensei and the Rakutenkai saw themselves not just as engaged in martial arts development or in spiritual exploration, but as a new kind of political and cultural avant-garde, the light of the world in a political sense. But even this combined East and West in its vision. On the one hand, they talked about avant-garde artists like Picasso and Jackson Pollock, but on the other hand, so powerful was their focus that they were ready to bet their own lives, in Ito Sensei's phrase, and were so committed to pursuing their keiko come what may, that they prepared their wills, just as the kamikaze pilots of World War II had done. The goal was to become a true avant-garde spearhead that could open the doors on new ways of living and being alive, and to share these until society, globally, not just in Japan, was transformed. This is a very 1960s ambition, and of course, the Rakutenkai years were the 60s. Bob Dylan's Like a Rolling Stone was at the top of the charts the week that they were formed. In 1970, the Rakutenkai disbanded its work done around the same time as the Beatles broke up. We think of the 60s as the decade of young people, rock music, hippies, the summer of love, turning on, tuning in and dropping out, the counterculture, revolution, Vietnam, the Paris May days, radical questioning of social and cultural, moral and political norms at every possible level. Rejecting conservatism, people experimented in all kinds of ways on all kinds of to topics. Though 1960s Tokyo was more conservative than San Francisco or Paris, it was still deeply affected by the same powerful forces. There was a student movement that demanded reform of the education system, challenged Japan's social norms and its close association with American materialism, and sought a new kind of liberty to live life in a different way from their parents. These students clashed repeatedly and violently with the police, and the universities were closed for the entire academic year of 1968-9. Masashi was supposed to be at college that year, he used his unexpected free time to join the Rakutenkai. Those Rakutenkai were breathing the same revolutionary air as the students. These graffiti from Nihon University used those same two words, GU, freedom, and Kaiho, liberation, as in the Rakutenkai mission. The top line says, I fight for freedom. The bottom line, though, says, Nihon University, liberated public toilet. A Shintaido office was set up in Shinjuku, the coolest, hippest part of Tokyo, specifically chosen to be where the radical people were. In 68, students occupied and trashed Shinjuku's subway station before occupying the universities. That put Shintaido at the heart of the protest movement. On one occasion, they themselves caused something of a disturbance by doing a big Eiko Kumite right outside the subway station in rush hour time. Indeed, the police were highly suspicious of Shintaido, particularly of the fact that it involved training students to fight with sticks. Ito-sensei had to spend a lot of time at the police station trying to explain that the essential purpose of bow practice was not to beat up the forces of law and order. Even so, at one gashku held on the beach, they found the dojo surrounded by hundreds of police. Like the student radicals, the Rakutenkai members were content to be poor and to live communally, though they didn't think of themselves as hippies for one thing, they didn't take drugs or drink, they didn't need to. But 
They were aligned with the student movement, rejecting materialism, the culture of the company, and Japanese government, US materialism. All this was an essential dimension of their search for freedom and truth, seeking to open the doors of perception by means of the new body way that could free them as individuals, also transform society, and ultimately change the world. Certainly when I first encountered Shintaira in Britain in the early 80s, this radical spiritual and social vision was strongly expressed, both by the then um, head instructor Ken Waite, who was the only non-Japanese Rakutenkai member and who brought Shintaira to Britain in the early 70s, and his students, including Jeffrey Fitch, who had followed him to Japan before setting up their own Shintaido commune near Heathrow. And I think it's fair to say that we Shintaido practitioners today, both in Britain and around the world, have been living off the spiritual and creative capital built up by the Rakutenkai back in the 60s, even if the ambition to transform society may have softened somewhat in the last 50 odd years. But even for those of us old enough to remember them, the wonderful, creative, idealistic mind expanding 60s now feel like ancient history. Times have changed and the attitudes and ambitions of young people today are not those of young people of the 60s. So that brings me on to the second part of this talk what happened to those ideals of the 60s in Keiko as well as more generally, and what relevance do they have for us today? The radicalism of the 60s is often thought to have fizzled out by the mid 70s. Why this may have happened is much debated. Some people say it's because uh, people grew up, got married and needed regular income, so turned back to the world of work. Others think it collapsed in a druggy haze, that its goals were too vague, hedonistic and disparate ever to have achieved much. Others say the oil crisis of 73 brought an economic slowdown that deterred experimentation. Yet others, though, argue that 60s radicalism didn't die out at all. It just transmuted in all sorts of ways into things like the women's movement, the peace movement, community activism, the fight against apartheid, gay liberation, the alternative health movement, and even the internet. There's some truth in all of these points of view, but to me, though much of what we call the 60s was undoubtedly exciting and amazingly inventive, it was surely the most exciting and inventive decade that I've ever lived through, but I can now see it was also often immature. Its creativity was not always sufficiently grounded to stop it drifting away down disparate paths. However, if we understand Shintaido as an expression of that worldwide spirit of challenge, liberation and discovery, then maybe we can say that what Aokisensei and the Rakutenkai achieved through their physical, spiritual and creative exploration in the 60s was arguably the most dynamic, the most grounded, the most powerful, the most inventive thing that happened anywhere in the world at that time. If that's right, then I'd say that they were, they are, the ultimate embodiment of the values of the 60s. This is a huge claim, I know, but who can you think of who can match them? Self-destructive geniuses like Hendrix or Lennon, self-conscious career-minded artists like Warhol, Maoist selling revolutionary papers on the streets, murderous cult leaders or gurus for driving Rolls Royces, None of these, nor even more enduring 60s luminaries like Dylan or Bowie, have the equivalent depth, intensity, complexity, clarity, consistency, commitment, or ultimately the vision of what human life can really be. We have all spent so long learning from Aokisensei, Ito-sensei, Musashi, and others that we can sometimes forget just how very exceptional they are. So if you accept that Shintaro provides a pure, perhaps the purest distillation of the spirit of the 60s, then maybe Shintaro can help us understand what happened to that spirit in later decades. 
Well, what I'd say happened is first it settled down. The communes broke up as people moved away, had families and pursued careers. Second, it moved beyond the breakthrough phase of crazy, challenging Keiko, of going beyond the limit of ecstatic kumite. Instead, it found ways to consolidate the insights of that breakthrough stage and made them far more available to all humanity, young or old, gay or straight, able-bodied or disabled, free or imprisoned, people with PhDs or people suffering learning difficulties. Third, it's moved beyond social radicalism into the peace movement and environmentalism. Fourth, it's developed a more internal spiritual mission, turning towards the new age or the mind, body and spirit movement, the alternative health movement, and offering a rich and safe kind of embodied spiritual development that, like the non-church movement, needs no creeds or faiths beyond an intuitive understanding of Ten Chi Jin. I'd sum all this up by saying that since 1970, Shintaido has neither collapsed, retrenched, nor grown complacent, but has become more mature, more stable, more humane, more accessible, altogether richer. This maturity, though, has come at a cost, which I'd call the partial loss of the spirit of the avant-garde, the pioneers thrusting forward to create a new society to be the light of the world. Indeed, this is not unique to Shintaido. Right across the board in art, politics, literature, music, the concept of an inspired and highly evolved revolutionary avant-garde leading the rest of society towards a brave new world, that concept has simply vanished. So what does all this mean for Shintaido in the 2020s? Has the Rakutenkai mission run its course or can we continue to draw on it for inspiration for the future, even as the last Rakutenkai members, Masashi and Ito-sensei, start to pull back from teaching regularly? Can we revitalize that mission? Can we take it on board for ourselves or even renew it for our own times? Or is it destined to be consigned to history, just as the students of May 68 in Paris are now little more than a historical footnote? Revitalizing the Rakutenkai mission is not a matter of pretending we still live in the late 60s or practicing the kind of neo-hippie keiko or even returning to endless jumping. That sort of nostalgia won't go anywhere and I don't think it's what our age needs. Nevertheless, I do think there's a real sense in which the mission offers something the 2020s do need today more than ever. If we can articulate that mission for ourselves, then more people, more widely, would see that Shintaido offers something that they desperately crave today. The clue lies in those now familiar words. To pursue truth through daily life. To acquire perfect freedom. To live with the light of freedom and become the light of the world. To pursue truth through daily life. We do but we live in what has been called a post-truth society, a post-modern world where truth is no longer objectively knowable, but is based on total subjectivity so that your truth is seen as no better or no worse than mine. A society where the most powerful people routinely, blatantly, shamelessly lie, where expertise is actively disparaged, often with a deadly phrase, fake news. A society where the craziest conspiracy theory grows bizarrely louder and more dangerous each time it's shown up to be groundless, a society where people feel gaslighted by their own governments, endlessly asserting things that we know to be false and claiming that we're weak for not seeing them too. A society indeed where it's become impossible to know what could be a sane response to that gaslighting, impossible to know even whether a challenging idea is the concoction of a conspiracy theorist or a reasonable questioning of a received truth. A society where all of us, whatever political shade we align with, suffer corrosive scepticism until we simply don't know what 
or who or how to trust. Barack Obama has pointed out where this will end. He said, if we don't have the capacity to distinguish what's true from what's false, by definition, our democracy doesn't work. And I'm sure that especially after recent events in Washington, we can all think of ways in which democracy has been endangered by the blizzards of falsehoods and evasions in the last few years. It's notable that tell the truth is one of the three core demands that climate protesters Extinction Rebellion are making to get the governments of the world to face up to the huge crises the world faces in the 2020s. Meanwhile, young people are tired of having their dreams repackaged and sold back to them, and they demand authenticity, the ability, freedom to seek, uh, so, and the freedom to live their lives in a way that expresses their personal truth. In the face of all this, Shintaro has, I believe, something important to offer, something we should be asserting loudly in our proportional activity and exploring in our keiko, to pursue truth through daily life. Shintaro is a powerful way to do this, a route to strengthening our understanding of ourselves and the nature of the reality that we inhabit. It offers a truth that combines science, logic, aesthetics, poetry, and internal wisdom and universal essence. It's a rich and complex vision of truth. And unlike the truth offered by ideologues and faiths, it doesn't ask you to sign up to any kind of creed. All these things come together in a powerful and rare manner, which we all know, I think, from Keiko, but which we don't always articulate clearly enough for us to be of help to the people around us who are crying out for a mature, rounded sense of where truth is to be found today. We would help ourselves grow Shintaido and simultaneously honor the Rakutenkai members and their mission, if only we could find ways to articulate more clearly that Shintaido is the new body way to discovering a solid, reliable path to finding truth on which we can base our lives. It's the same with acquiring perfect freedom, the perfect liberty. In the last half decade dominated by the noisy right wing has seen both words appallingly corrupted and tainted in Britain with demands for liberty from the tyranny of the European Union, the liberty to turn away immigrants who want to steal our jobs. In the United States, with liberty from interference by federal government, liberty to carry an assault rifle to use on school children, and much more. The law, which Britain used to boast of as being the bastion of our traditional liberty, <clears throat> is now even being presented by the press at least as being a threat to that liberty. Similarly, the once lofty notion of personal freedom has degenerated into a squalid freedom to refuse to wear masks or accept a vaccination needle or the myopic freedom to consume without caring what impact that consumption may have on future generations. In other words, the quest for personal liberty has become the freedom to endanger the lives of others. Free speech has become the freedom to insult and abuse. The freedom and liberty which the Rakutenkai and the rest of the 60s counterculture were seeking have become subverted and devalued. But again, Shintaido is a good place to assert those older values. In Keiko, we learn to move openly and freely without constraints beyond the expectations of a rigid or corrupt society. We explore the freedom of living with a great world of spirit. We learn to meet people in Kumite, whoever they are, wherever they come from, without preconceptions, to share ourselves and to open ourselves to whatever they may have to teach us. Ultimately, we discover authenticity and the freedom of being fully alive. How we use Keiko to explore freedom and truth is up to each of us, especially those who give gore. For me, as I hope members of my little group have understood, truth is to be found in Eiko, 
in Kenjutsu Kumite, in Kiryoroshi Kumite, in Diamond 8 Cutting, Liberty, in Jumping, in Wakame, in Hikari, in Tenshin Gosu, in Seiza. You may find you have a different list, but I'm sure that you could construct such a list and you could communicate it with some passion. So to sum up, I urge us all individually in our local groups and in our national organizations to go back to the values that Ito Sensi and Masashi and their friends and colleagues committed themselves to, and for us explicitly to make that same commitment now, to carry on the Rakutenkai spirit of optimism, to shape our organizations, to fulfill that commitment, to find the language, to express that commitment in terms that the rest of the world can resonate with, and ultimately to change the world for the better. To pursue truth through daily life, to acquire perfect freedom, to live with the light of freedom and become the light of the world. What else is Joshintaro for?